Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Criminger. I'm one of the co-chairs of the South Carolina Progressive Networks Education Fund. And the Majeska Simpkins School for Human Rights is the network's signature project. And we're so glad you're here. This is our sixth iteration of the school. We want to welcome everybody, a warm welcome to everybody. We've got more students than we've ever had before. And just a quick reminder, everybody's on mute. And we'll go over more Zoom protocol later. Um, our next video is the Majeska Simpkins School lead faculty, Dr. Robert Green, giving a brief introduction and then a, po a poem from acclaimed South Carolina poet, Nikki Finney. Chris, do you want to uh, cue up the next video? Um, for those of you who don't know, but I think everyone here knows who Nikki Finney is. She is indeed the voice of South Carolina and the voice of, of modern Black America in so many different ways. Uh, she is, of course, a winner of the National Book Award. Uh, she is currently a professor at the University of South Carolina. Uh, but Nikki Finney is so much more than that. Uh, she is a child of South Carolina. Uh, she is a child of the South. And whenever you read or listen to her poetry, uh, you really get that sense of the history of the region. And really, I think Nikki Finney is someone who represents the best of the South. Uh, in, in recent weeks, we've had a lot of debates about the symbolism of the Confederate flag and Confederate statues and such as representing the South. I think that's absolute nonsense. It's people like Nikki Finney who really represent what the South can and should be. Um, so I want to go ahead and turn the floor over to uh, Nikki Finney right now. And then thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I appreciate, uh, Robert, that introduction. Um, I laugh a little bit uh, it, when you call me the, the voice of South Carolina because there's some people who wish I would leave <laughs> and not keep opening my mouth. But we're not talking about them today. We're talking about us. And I just want to I just want to do a short little thing about two words that begin with the letter A. And um, one is being an autodidact. And I think it's really important to talk about this as you graduate from a program, right? Because being an autodidact, I didn't know what that was until I got in my 30s. And I kept saying, why do I have to go find all this information that I was supposed to be taught in school all along my life? They say they're educating me. They are not educating me fully. They're educating me about some things, and they're keeping a lot of the education out. That's what's so beautiful about the Majeska Simpkins School. And being an autodidact, is when you say, I want to be educated without a master at the front of the room. I want to be educated without a formal teacher at the front of the room. I want to be in a circle of people who will educate each other. That's what partly being an autodidact is. And I just wish I had been in some of those classes. And I need to sign up for the next round of classes because I need to go through this learning and this understanding with you in a, in a new kind of way. So I just want to plop that word down in your psyche to say that now that you have your walking papers from the Majeska Simpkins School, you still must be an autodidact. You must go looking for more information. You must uh, uh, keep searching for, because that's what Miss Simpkins was. You know, she just was a, a learner, a, a everyday what can I learn? What more do I need to learn? And so I just, I teach this everywhere I go to anybody who will listen. Captive audiences count. Um, that you must stay hungry for all the information that you have gotten and even the information that you don't know just yet. And that brother just before us was also talking about, right? The learning, the lifelong learning that must happen when you are an activist because uh, there's so much that has been kept from us. The second thing I want to talk to you about is the word audacity. When I was a little girl growing up in South Carolina, a little black girl growing up in South Carolina, I was not taught to be audacious. In fact, I was talked out of being audacious. I was told to be smart, but audacious was not on the framework of what I was taught to be. Why? Because of the definition of the word audacious, audacity. If you look it up, the first definition says, uh, definition number one says, a willingness to take bold risks, right? The second definition of audacity is rude or disrespectful 
behavior or imp impudence. One definition, bold and courageous. Second definition, rude, right? So what does that tell you? Those two definitions, I love studying the root language of words. When you, when you are audacious, there will be people who will call you rude. But you're really being bold and courageous. And you must not worry about that. That's not your, that's not your trouble. That's just in the, de it comes with the territory. But you must still embrace being, having the audacity to do what you need. To, why else would you take this class with Majeska Simpkins' name on it if you are not willing, as you walk out of it, right, to have some audacity in your life or have some more audacity in your life than you had when you, before you walked in? So I just want to turn us to that word. And I just want to tell you how I, as a, a, a little girl who wasn't given that word, began to wear it around my neck like a necklace because I wanted to be more and more audacious but not in the way that everybody else was being audacious, because we all have to be audacious in our own individual way. I can't be audacious like Ms. Marjorie. I can't be audacious like Brett. I have to come through another door and be audacious like Nikki. So I'm quiet for the most part, but when I pick up a pencil, all bets are off. All bets are off. I can, I can, I can be in a room with you, and I can have polite conversation, but when I'm coming at you with my audaciousness as a poet, that's different. You can come at me audaciously as a farmer or as a, uh, a reporter or as somebody who works in a store doing something else, but you can be audacious in your own kind of way. So I just wanted to read one poem that reflects, I think, the kind of audaciousness that I'm hoping that you will hold on to, um, that you received in this program. I'm so, I'm so um, thrilled to be here and to be a part of it. Audacity. You gotta have it in order to fight in this battle. And remember, the first definition is courage and boldness. And the second one is that people will call you impudent. They will say you are you are exhibiting bad behavior. And guess what? That's okay, because you know the truth about what you are doing and why you are doing it. I'm so proud of you. Blessings. I hope to make the next class. Thank you for this invitation. We love you, Nikki Penny. <laughs> we thank everyone for being here. And we decided to leave the door open this time, moving from 30 students, the max we've had for, for the last uh, five classes, to um, having probably close to 100 now. And so this is for you, uh, knowing that we have hopefully a pandemic that will be ending, we've got your attention, and you can go out and spread the word and help try and develop the capacity to be able to do, implement the values that we talk about today. And um, what, what I wanted to do now was to basically talk a little bit about Majeska. And Chris, if you could cue up some of those, those um, clips that hopefully we're going to show and we can hear and make sure, Chris, that your, your sound is up on your audio all the way by the, your mute button, there's an audio control. And what I wanna do is to, to set up these clips. They're very short things that either we've taken from um, the, uh, the moving, uh, moving image archives at the university, which is a wonderful source for you to go to. And there, as we scroll through these, you can see kind of the name of them and the, um, their the date they are, and you can figure out how to get into these archives and uh, poke around the, the stuff that we found, uh, we've put up there. And I have the good, good fortune and responsibility to clean out the little house by Majeska's house in the mid eighties for one of our staff people at Grove and took truckloads of things to the Carolina library where they've recently been scanned and are available to the public. Uh, Chris, let's play this first one here. This, this is a police brutality clip that is reflective of the type of thing you're seeing now with police brutality with Majeska speaking at a press conference. Oh, stop it, Chris, till we get the noise. Sorry, hold on a second. Mm. 
Play it on the small screen if you need to. has been concerned, uh, never, uh, well, they've never been satisfied about the bar that was said to have hanged himself at the jail last year. They uh, have been greatly concerned and are still concerned about the some conditions around the killing of Grant Brown by Officer Nates on November the 8th. And we have had a report, in fact, I talked to a young woman who was uh, beaten and had her, uh, a tooth broken off down at the jail and a young student who was beaten while handcuffed at the jail. A few days ago. So this 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 is the the next clip is the sheriff talking about Majeska, but let me let me say that she had been involved uh, for a long time at this point. This is 1965, and uh, Ms. Simpkins had been run out of the NAACP that she helped found in 1957, and so she had been uh, on the radar screen of all the authorities for a good while, and um, was known as a troublemaker. And so this next clip where it says, um, Sheriff Frank Powell calls me Jessica Communist, speaks for itself. Let the sheriff talk. I noted last night on the television a statement made by one Majeska Simpkins with considerable disgust of her condemning our fine police department and asked for the removal of Chief Campbell. I have noted here over the past 18 months that this particular individual, who I would call as the queen of minority voting in South Carolina, has criticized everything in our community, from the man on the street to the mentally ill at our fine state hospital. I have in my possession a report from the House on American Activities Committee alleging that she was a member or participated in over 30 communist fronts throughout the United States. I think it is high time that the public officials let the, our citizens throughout this state know a little bit of the background of this particular individual. She has advocated disarming this country, among other things. She supported communists uh, who are running for public office. She's active, actively campaigned for communists in New York itself. Our police department, granted, may have mistakes, as all big organizations do. But in this particular instance, I think it's high time the city, the city manager, Kerry Barnett, and Honorable Lester Bates, our mayor, and each city councilman public, publicly come out and defend our chief of police and the, and the police department itself. So that was Frank Powell, who was sheriff for an awfully long time. He was sheriff uh, when I was getting arrested. Uh, not not many years after that, my first arrest in Richland County was uh, '69, I think. And that um, this business about Miss Simpkins being a communist is something that we're going to get into today. We're just going to tease you with some things that are provocative, but we really get into the roots of when did communism become the big booger bear, and that would that's going to become uh, fairly apparent when we start talking about Jimmy Burns and uh, end of World War II and the dropping of the bomb. But uh, the next clip here. Is Majesco on education, and um, I didn't see the date on that, but we'll get that when we go back. My mother and father were fearless, and we were raised that way. With a skin bone in my body, no time. You, if, you, if you get pushed back in a corner. Like I have been sometimes. You got to fight your way out. You know what you're going to be back there all that time. I always said I would join working with anybody who's going my way. Now that means I don't have to go his way. But if he's going my way, I'll work with him. The case for equal educational opportunity began with a bus transportation suit. Now sometimes you go in and create the atmosphere for a case and work out the clients according to what where you want the case to go. But that rise came out of the people themselves because their children were walking in the rain and storms and snow and sleet as white children ruled it. Well, they hated the whites and just they had as much right to pay in taxes like white people. So they decided we ought to have riding too, which was, was right. And the Clarendon case arose out of Clarendon and they needed state office and national office assistance. 
At that time, the intent was separate but equal. When we first went to court, uh, that was when Judge Waring said, why I told uh, uh, Justice Marshall, why do you come in here talking about separate but equal? If you want to do anything, attack the whole system. Thus encouraged, the South Carolina State Conference agreed to prepare a test case. 20 plaintiffs would be required for such a major effort. The Reverend J.A. Delane and others undertook the challenge of securing petitioners. So the, the educational uh, struggle uh, between the full segregation and the uh, integration that South Carolina called uh, the equalization period uh, was a long, long time. From 1954, I graduated from a segregated school system in 66. We had school buses turned over in Lamar in 1970. And that, the, that the, we still have a, a struggle for integration, but the, that struggle focusing on education was really kind of the big straw that, that started breaking down some of the barriers and happened right here in South Carolina. And so we'll get into that uh, as we move through the eras in the class. And this, uh, sure. Becky, we're going to save this last uh, mm -hmm. clip for later. We're going to do that now to rise up. Becky? Uh, Chris, the, that economics clip we're saving the, the rise up for the end of the show, Becky? Yeah. So play that clip now or we're waiting? Yeah, if you have the rock, you have the economics clip? Yes, yes. Okay, do the economics and save that last one that says later for the closing shot because it's really uplifting at the end of the program. And so this is the about using your the power of dollar. Things to blacks and they wouldn't sell certain things to blacks, and uh, certain privileges mm. of jobs were taken away. So then, somewhere I don't remember now where we got it from, but the term of economic freeze came up. An economic freeze was cutting, you know, cutting somebody's income. So then we froze on the stores. Back her up, rolling on the back, trying to get home. Gotta see us rolling on the strap, trying to get home. I got to cross that old ticket curtain. Bad man, baby bird. It's a rough, rocky road to travel, trying to get home. It was a turbulent period throughout the Deep South, and in South Carolina, fully a decade would pass before the tide began to turn. All through the fight, through slavery, and uh, the civil rights all coming up until now, there were whites that didn't believe in what the power structure was doing, and you would always hear me use the expression power structure. Because not all the whites were, were in that realm of thought. During the height of her involvement with the state NAACP conference, Majeska was simultaneously involved with a number of reform movements on the regional and national levels. She was one of only five black women to participate in the historic Durham conference. She was also a member of its offspring. The Southern Regional Council became the first major biracial group in the South. Well, Majeska had been an important person in the South Carolina branch of the Commission on Interracial Cooperation, probably the most militant and outspoken member of that commission. And uh, I assume that, that, that that's why she was invited. But in any case, the uh, out of that Durham meeting came a... Uh, a, a remarkable document for the time 
The Southern Negro Youth Congress met in an interracial body in Columbia, South Carolina in 1946. Here, Paul Robeson sang, and W.E.B. Du Bois gave his famed Behold the Land address. Majeska Simpkins was the convention organizer, and that post-war youth legislature attracted a thousand delegates, black and white, foreign and American. She was a charter member of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, which was organized in 1938 and inspired by Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. The Southern Conference for Human Welfare was organized, I mean, it had its headquarters in Birmingham, and it was organized to improve conditions, uh, not just for blacks, but for disadvantaged whites in the South. Brett, we can't hear you. You're speaking, but you're on mute. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I wanted to um, pause and um, back up and talk a little bit about how we got to be here today and calling this thing the Majeska School. Those of you that don't know her, and these are some of your initial impressions of her, um, she's a very deep lady, very deep lady. And I had the, the privilege and responsibility of being her left-hand person for the last uh, nearly 20 years of her life. And we'll get into how that happened that a white middle class guy uh, was carrying the torch for this black activist. How did that happen? And um, you heard Majeska being called a communist. And I think one of the most informative things that she, the little quotes from Chairman Majeska, she said, no, I'm, I'm not a communist, but if they're doing all those good things you say they are, maybe I should be. And it kind of goes to the heart of just doing right and not being... Uh, with a, a, a political party that has some other motivations and concerns than you do as a human being that's trying to do justice. And so that individual path that she was willing to strike out on, I got her a lot of trouble. But um, uh, as, you, as you can see, as we um, watch other things and learn more about what she did, she, she, I'm about the age that she was when I met her. She was born in 1899. Uh, raised really well and passed away in 1992. And we had already started the grassroots organizing workshop uh, in the mid 70s. And Majeska was our mentor. She was a board member. And by then she had been iced from the, the, the black community of civil rights activists. And she would bridle if you called her a civil rights activist. She said, I'm a human rights activist. And she, she considered that the racial oppression was something that was a symptom of a larger grasp of power and money. And we'll get into that deeper too. And we have the absolute wonderful benefit of having somebody that really knows how to get deep into things. Dr. Robert Green II, a recent PhD out uh, uh, teaching students now at Claflin on a regular basis, but Robert got his, his PhD from the University of South Carolina. And he's a rare academic with a great deal of insight into political reality. So welcome Dr. Green. He's gonna be our, our uh, faculty coordinator for the whole session. Robert? Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Brett. And I am so humbled and, and pleased to see everyone here this afternoon. Um, the thing about the Majeska School, uh, as I've been able to teach it for a, a third year in a row now, is that it is a place, the rare place, where you can see academics, activists, and just concerned citizens all come together to, to learn more about the state, nation, and world that we live in. Um, and I want to begin my brief, very brief remarks by quoting from um, an article in Ebony Magazine uh, from November of 1965. Uh, and the article was actually entitled Black Power. Um, it's an article by Lerone Bennett Jr. where he talks about the importance of South Carolina to the Reconstruction era. And so I wanna read this very brief statement because I believe it actually sums up what the Majestic School is all about. Now, at the beginning of the article, Lerone Bennett wrote, quote, when the first Bastille fell, some men walked the streets of Paris, totally unaware of the new thing that had moved in the womb of the human spirit. It was the same, we are told, in the streets of Boston, when Minutemen in nearby Lexington fired certain shots that were heard in distant places. As it was in Paris and Boston in the 18th century, so it was in Charleston, South Carolina, 
on the day in the 19th century when the first official Western assembly with a black majority held its first session, end quote. Now that's Lerone Bennett talking about the attempt to create what would become known as the 1868 South Carolina Constitution. But it also, I believe, captures the spirit of activism, of revolution, of radicalism, of simple human dignity that flows throughout the history of South Carolina. Now, Brett mentioned a moment ago that Majeska Simpkins was born in 1899 and died in 1992. And I think it's interesting that we often think of South Carolina history as different eras uh, named after different bad people in history, like the age of John C. Calhoun or the age of Ben Tillman or the age of Strom Thurmond. But in a sense, the 20th century in South Carolina could be thought of as the age of Majeska Simpkins. Now, I think what we're doing here in this class today and for our classes throughout this uh, semester is really delving deep into the true people's history of South Carolina, really digging into what the indigenous peoples were like here, for example, uh, before the arrival of the first Europeans, thinking about the long history of enslavement of both indigenous peoples and Africans as well, that really laid the foundation for South Carolina considering the legacies of the Civil War and reconstruction of the state, and thinking about the long lineage and legacy of not just Jim Crow segregation, but the fight and resistance against said segregation. Ultimately, coming to the Majeska School means that you are a concerned citizen. You might be someone interested in activism. You are certainly someone interested in helping everyday people really make it through what is sometimes a tough, tough and difficult life here in South Carolina. But I also wanna make everyone aware of the fact that it is perfectly fine. In fact, it is expected of all of you to have some fun in the class too. Um, I'm hoping that as we've done in the past, of course, that we can all have a good time. We can all learn a lot of good things. We can all get to know and learn more about each other. But it's that human dignity, that human touch, albeit via Zoom this time around, that I think also makes the Majestic School different from any other educational experience you may have had in the past. Now, again, as Brett mentioned, I, my day job is as an assistant professor of history at Cloudflare University. Uh, I've written various essays and other things for a variety of publications such as The Nation, uh, The Washington Post, Jacobin, Descent, uh, and so forth. If I look a little tired today, it's because I'm also uh, putting the finishing touches on an edited collection that we hope comes out later this year about the history of African-Americans at University of South Carolina. But the Majesca School is something that I have deeply cared about for years now. And I am, as I said before, truly humbled and indeed very much heartened to see everyone here this afternoon. I think it'll be a fun class. It'll be a wonderful class. And what I want to do now is to let a few graduates from previous classes say a few words about um, what they have learned from the Majesca School and more importantly, why the Majesca School has mattered so much to them. Um, so before I do that, Brett, do you have any additional words of wisdom you wanna add about the uh, class before we move forward? Brett, Brett, you're talking again and we... I'm sorry, Robert, I, what, I had... I was trying to find Big Yonder. What, what did you ask me? Oh, I was just asking if you had any additional uh, words you wanted to add before we called on a few graduates to talk about the previous Majeska classes. You've muted yourself again, Brett. Now we can hear you. Never mind. Well, I've lost my audio signal, my, my hearing. I can't hear you. I don't know why it's gone away, but you'd have to go on without me. But okay. Lillian, I know Lillian and Laura are here, so call on them to say something. Sure. All right, so we'll start with uh, Lillian. Uh, please go first, and then Laura. And then I think I also saw uh, Bikyanga was in the, in the um, room as well. So we'll go Lillian, Laura, and Bikyanga uh, after that. So Lillian, go right ahead. Uh, sure. Thanks, guys. It's really uh, exciting for me to see so many familiar faces on the screen at once, um, many of who I knew last semester and also seeing a lot of friends um, that are joining this semester. So that's super exciting um, and it's kind of comforting for me to see all you guys. But um, I'm Lillian Boatwright. I live in Clemson. I, uh, you know, I have a day job, but I also was elected to the uh, Pickens County Board of 
reflections while I was in the middle of my Majeska school semester last year. And uh, since then, I've been working on helping the community educate on elections rights, uh, kind of using the oomph that the school gave me and the knowledge of the community around me. Um, it's really been it's really been an interesting nine months or so since that started. Um, you know, kind of like Majeska was saying in the video, it's it's interesting when you realize how you feel about things, you start learning about things and educating and all of a sudden um, you're not welcomed by people that are around you that were welcoming to you previously uh, when you start standing up for things and speaking out for things. So, you know, a lot of you have already felt that and if you haven't, you might at some point, um, but this group of people has really given me the confidence to take that on. You know, I know I can email Brett or chat with him and just, complain for a while and then I don't have to do it publicly and everything's fine. Um, but then the the knowledge that this group of people has given me and the comfort of asking questions that I didn't know where else to ask them is really invaluable. So I, I hope you all find that here as well. Thanks guys. Thank you, Lily. And I heard all those kind words. I worked cheap through. Um, so is Laura out there? She most definitely is. <laughs> Laura's in the house. Take it, Laura. Hi, everybody. Everybody, wake up. Wake up. I want to see your fingers and your faces. Everybody, there you go. There you go. There you go. This is why I joined the Mojeska Simpson School. Uh, I joined because I wanted to do something. And I was, at the time, had finished a stint working in a nonprofit organization that had me as an organizer but prohibited me from visiting a particular community more than once. I was to go and give the spiel about what we do, blah, 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 and tell them to organize and then leave. And then if they wanted to organize, they would just do it on their own and then call me back to give them more information about the laws of South Carolina. I needed something more. I needed to get into action. I am deeply rooted in my community and I knew that what we needed was organizing capacity and going beyond that, we needed to have an organizing capacity that was rooted in history and was rooted in the process and the repetition of history and examining very deeply and very seriously what we have been doing in this state for many, many years and repeating it over and over and over with no results. And we've all heard of those expressions about that. So I joined the Majeska Simpson School. One of the things that called my attention, and I'll be honest, it wasn't the history part so much. Sorry, Dr. Green. But it was that very last part where it said we were all expected to develop our own organizing projects. That was music to my ears. And I remember uh, at that time I had been uh, talking to um, uh, Reverend Neil for a long time. and. Uh, we had a conversation about the need to really have organizing on the ground projects, not just the name grassroots, but really doing it. Uh, after I joined the Majeska Simpkins School, at the end, I don't know how many projects really uh, we um, uh, developed in there, but mine was organizing the immigrant community in South Carolina, and particularly focusing in the Latino uh, immigrant community. So we started a project that was called Somos Sur Carolina. It just means that we are South Carolina. And it was a project that was designed to uh, assert and reaffirm our place in the history and the recent history of the development of the economy and social history of this state and all the contributions. Um, we also started Grassroots Alliance for Immigrant Rights uh, shortly after um, the last administration was coming into place, so we were focusing really on immigration enforcement. Uh, and the idea there was to bring together grassroots impacted communities together with groups that were allies and organizers that were more from the top down. Um, so that project uh, was done during the initial stages for people to understand the executive orders of the administration and go on. And many people have gone on from that group to develop their own initiatives and become engaged in fighting immigration enforcement um, uh, policies, um, not only in South Carolina, but across the nation. And then lastly, we formed 
um, the group that's called Fuerza Girasol. Fuerza Girasol is in Colombia at the moment. Uh, we are uh, solely devoted to um, working our organizing uh, energies or directing our energies in three directions. One are uh, spaces in which we can work against the state. That is the resistance part of our organizing work because bad laws just have to be resisted. There is no two ways around it. And that's the old traditional organizing ideas that we all see. Um, the second bucket that we work in is working within the state because sometimes you have to work within the political structures that are already set up and work from the inside out. So that's our political game. That's uh, building our political power, uh, getting uh, more voters registered in our community, getting people involved. Even if they are non-citizens, people can still get involved in the political process because the policies that are being put in place are directly attacking them. And under a human rights framework, people have a right to resist those attacks. And the third bucket is working again without the state because there are some times that no resistance and no amount of political uh, work will actually get you the resources that you need from the state. So you have to build them yourself. And that is what we're doing right now. The Majeska Simpson School allowed us to build and organize around those frameworks. And then the Progressive Network helped us uh, as a fiscal sponsor to organize our funding. We do our own fundraising and uh, pretty soon we're gonna be developing our own nonprofit so that we can um, jump off uh, and just be another organization, but it will be from the ground up. And if it hadn't been for the Majeska Simpson School, I don't think that I would have had the, the space or the platform in which to do it and jump off from. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. No, th thank you, Laura. And we did not pay her a dime to, to do that. This, <laughs> is, this is a true testimonial. But the woman, she obviously has her own spunk before she came to us. But the work that she's doing, nobody was supporting. There was nobody in South Carolina that was actually working to empower people that were here that were undocumented and being treated very badly. And, and so the, Laura mentioned the inside outside approach to making change. That's something that we get into very deeply because when you come out of the Majestic School, you're going to learn how to play both of those ends off against the middle to be able to take, to to make the people with the power uh, less powerful and the, and the meeker more powerful. So it's the inside outside game that we get into. And Bikyanga, if you're out there with us, I want you to say a few words. And Bikyanga is um, last year's student and that he's from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he has come here to learn about democracy. And I said, boy, you're gonna learn a lot of holes that you can fall in so you can avoid them when you go home. And I just wrote Bikyanga a reference in a, um, for the law school here at the university. And so he's going to soak up all he can here about the way democracy should be practiced, can be practiced, and what civilization could look like and take it home. Bikyanga, a couple of words from you, Guy. Thank you very much, Brett. I'm very excited to see how many people are coming this year. And it encouraged me to show that a lot of people are motivated to take this course. So one of the things I can tell new colleagues is that don't see Madrasa School as local or national. So the, 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 the impact of this school, it can go abroad outside of United States. So what we are learning here, we are trying to compare the knowledge, what happened in this state and how we can compare what is happening in our country. So I'm, I'm very glad to come here. And uh, as I told you that my name is Bikyanga Saidi. I'm from Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I know we know a lot uh, about uh, when I was studying this, we saw a lot of, a lot of slavery in these countries. So some of the people, I'm quite sure that they, they came from Congo <laughs> for a for, for long time, even though we might not know them at the moment, but I'm quite sure that we have got our blood in, in these areas. So what, what, what you go through 
is very important for us to know and uh, to take it back and how we can try to improve our own life there. So when, when, when I'm explaining about the, what I learned from this course, uh, I will try to relate to what we are doing back home and how our country are doing and how this class will did help me to go and help back home, to motivate, to organize at home, to bring something like engage the citizen, because I'm quite sure that back home, a uh, lot of people are not uh, really standing for their right. They, they, they are accepting situation. So they see that it's normal. So by this class, I learn a lot and how people, regardless of the hard environment, where I don't know what Vicky, you got it. Is that it, Bikyunga? Yes. Hard environment which people used under strong environment where regardless of how what the power which was used to bring down all activists who wanted to engage a citizen but people have courage to say no, regardless of oppression, we will stand and we will stick, we will encourage our communities to stand for their right. So what I'm trying to say is that in Africa, we don't have race, we don't have white and black people, but here we have issues of black and white people. So that is a captured state. It was a captured state whereby when the white are ruling, they oppress black people. So black people were, were not getting a lot of service. So it's like the state was concentrating on building inequality instead of equalities. So the same things we are experiencing in Africa is that uh, instead of white and black, we, we are trying to have uh, state is captured uh, through the system of tribalism, ethnicity. So when one ethnicity is governing, so they try to control the whole system of governance. So they oppress as an ethnic group, which are not in the ruling parties. So you understand that that is the comparison I want to make here. So, but a lot of African people will remain. We don't want to stand to defend their right. So what, what I'm saying by learning what the Majeska school did, the Majeska school is teaching us for the history of these countries, that knowledge, that courage which people stood to defend the right, to defend social justice, we will take, I will take that knowledge, go back with it, and try to see how we can apply in our own countries. So we learn a lot in, in Majeska School how to organize uh, the, the advocacy, how we can advocate for sound public policies and how you can come in contact with politicians to try to improve the well-being of people. So all, all those techniques, I will take them with me and then when I go back, so I can help to organize, to mobilize uh, other people in my countries to see how we can move ahead. Uh, a little bit about the history of my country is that uh, Congo is a very rich country. But unfortunately, we live under autocratic leadership for almost 15 years, 50 years. So no democracy, no, no, no freedom of choice, no political party were allowed those times. So people were oppressed during all those periods. And the people could not stand to defend the, the, their right. So the state used also, like the same year, they used the question powers, like police, intelligence service, and the army to oppress everyone with a different view. Everyone who wants to change things will be oppressed. Some people will be killed. Uh, manifestation, people to demonstrate, not allowed. So all those kinds of politics. And you can see backward in South Carolina, people experience the same things. So, but still people stand. We're not afraid, you know, to, 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 to defend their rights. So, so those techniques, which I learned from my Jesus school about the activities, how people went to do through mobilizing people. So I, I want to use the same technique when I go back home, 
So that is my vision when I go back home to mobilize people and uh, to defend our country, to bring our country back to the democracy, to good governance, uh, rule of law. So uh, that is what they need to see that there is a social justice uh, where policy are developed to equal distributive where everyone can get his part in a- Well, thank you, Bikyango. What we're going to have to do is to let people that want to get to know you and have a personal briefing on the Democratic Republic of Congo, you uh, put your contact information in the chat box so they can follow up with Bikyanga. And um, Bikyanga, we appreciate it. We're going thank to, you very much for, thank you, for giving the opportunity to uh, yeah. talk a little bit about protocol. Uh, Becky Robbins, our communications director, and I have to admit that she has is 51 percent certainly at least of the brains of this operation as we've been married now for a number of years and she worked with me at grow starting in 1991 and so there's a great woman that needs to be in front of uh, this fellow and becky has written some books that are online we're going to send those of you that have paid your tuition copies of these books uh, as well as um a a uh, dvd of the full movie of the that etv did of majeska in 1989, a few years before she passed, and you saw clips from that uh, that, the, that were the better produced clips that ETV did. And we found out that the video, that that particular DVD is so old that these new machines won't play it. So we're gonna send you a, a copy you can share with your friends and family. And so uh, uh, Chris, if you wanna put the homepage up, uh, we'll go through the types of things that the resources that are there that if we don't tell you about them, there's so much there that you may miss it. And then we're going to have a question and answer period and Dr. Green will take questions and um, anything that Dr. Green can't answer, I'll make up and, and fill in for him. See if you can go a larger screen there, Chris, so people can see it. Um, I'm sorry, Brett. Did you want me to walk through the, the website? Well, Becky's going to help you. Okay, is that, are y'all seeing the screen? Is it large enough? Yeah. Or maybe a little, maybe a little large. I'm, can't tell, Becky. Um, I can I can kind of walk through the site. Um, Becky had um, asked me to do that earlier. Okay. Um, so um, this is the landing screen for the Majeska School site. Um, as we're going through the class um, throughout the semester, this class recordings tab. If you go there right now, we won't have any. There's there's nothing there, but um, we'll be recording these um, Zoom meetings. And so each class will be uploaded here. So if there's ever a class you miss, you can come here to the class recordings page and, um, and catch up um, in between. Um, on the class schedule, this is going to um, have all of our dates. Typically, the schedule is alternating Mondays, but there are a few um, chance uh, examples where we have the Monday falls on a holiday and so it'll get shifted forward or backwards a week. So if you're, um, this is where you can come and um, find the dates of all of the classes, but then you can also um, click on um, each, each class and that will take you for the, to the readings. Um, within um, the readings, there are um, hyperlinks to go um, even further in depth. Um, and there's uh, a lot of times it'll be videos and other supplemental materials, um, but that's, that can all be found here on the class schedule. Um, again, both um, the dates of our meetings and the readings for the class. Um, so we will send out prior to every class, a week prior to every class, a reminder of when the next class is or the link to appropriate readings any new information that we have discovered and who the guest speaker is for that class if we have one. Thank you, Brett. Um, also, we have a tuition tab. If you haven't um, 
uh, gone through this yet, um, you can do a one-time payment for the whole class, or you can pay um, pay as you go. Um, <clears throat> and any anything else you needed me to cover there, Brett? Well, I would just mention for the, the scholarship students, this is all kind of based on different needs and different walks of life. And the people have spoken to me and we've worked out arrangements of them making donations that can be recurring, small donations that can recur for years to come. So they help support the organization and don't go broke while they're learning. Right, so we've got, yeah, um, both donate options and, and tuition. Yeah, the, the it, people that wanted to be that are on the scholarship track, their their money comes in through the donation, and they can make a recurring donation there. And let me say at this point that um, one of the reasons that the Progressive Network exists and that we started the Majeska School, and the Majeska raised hell for so long, is we didn't do it for the money. Uh, we have just an amazingly small budget and have done an amazing amount of work with the notion that if you want to build a popular movement to actually make substantive change, it needs to be popular. If it's popular, it needs to be supported by the people that enjoy it and benefit from it, and that's you. And so everybody needs to be a member. You can uh, go to the homepage of the scpronet.com and click join, uh, and you can also donate on a recurring basis there. And uh, we do want everybody to, to, to join up and to help contribute to a sense of community, the beloved community that Dr. King spoke of, of shared values. And that's to mention that these booklets here, click on the booklets and let people see about these booklets. Right here on the middle of the top bar. Scroll down. Now, these books can be read online, and um, they're much more fun to hold in your hand. They're really actually beautiful publications, and Becky's quite a competent design person as well as a, a writer, uh, and that uh, the Richland County Conservation Commission has given us grants to produce these books, and these are uh, two women that we worked closely with over the decades, and um, Sarah Leverett and, and Harriet Hancock. Thank you, Chris. Is there anything else that we need to touch on there, Becky, on the protocol? About protocol, but I would just remind folks that there's also a link at the top of that page of the Majeska School website to um, follow the, the Facebook page of the Majeska School. And it's a great place to um, to share links and information. And you can read there some of Dr. Green's reviews and things that get posted. Um, he was very self-deprecating. I thought that we're so lucky to have Dr. Green and there's, that'd be a good place to keep up with the kind of um, contribution that he's making weekly, it seems like. I don't know if he ever sleeps, but I would encourage you if you're on Facebook to um, follow that page and also just to bookmark the website because it's gonna be, the classes will be updated. We're in the process now of updating some of the material because as you know, history keeps marching and so we find new things every use. So, so, um, we've got new resources that will be updating those classes, so um, those will be posted as they get completed. And um, I, we, we understand that this is a real challenge with on Zoom, and some of this is um, some of the protocols and, and all of that is kind of new for a lot of this. So I appreciate your granting us grace as we work through some of these technical things, and we'll do the same for you. And there is a blog on the homepage that you can get to that has, um, I think it goes back to 2000 and I don't, it goes back a long ways. And one of the things I've found is that people can go find out what was happening here. If you're concerned about Medicaid, go to the blog and Google Medicaid and you'll find, you'll find pictures of us being arrested uh, in 2014, blocking entrance to the state house or about the fight over the budget in uh, several years in 2011. And there's, really alarming photograph of 200 of us with t-shirts on saying stop the cuts storming into the mob mobbing the lobby and stopping the, the uh, legislature and so our history for good and bad can be found here at the blog and there's a search thing and then there's dr green at that uh, at the 2018 class and i i, I guess that's 
we're at that point where I think, Robert, we can bring bring you back to take questions. I don't know if, if people have put questions in the chat, but if they haven't, they can start now. And um, I wanted to uh, let you wrap it up, Robert, and then we'll have, after questions, we'll have that last video. All right, and again, if there are, if you have any general questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, okay, so I see Omari has a question. Can we do a special protest art extra session from Strange Fruit to Fight the Power? To we gonna be all right? That's actually not a bad idea. Um, I know that Brett and I have talked a lot about doing uh, breakout sessions as well, where we kind of discuss some of the themes from the course in a more informal setting. So I think certainly one that, that focuses on art would be a good one. Uh, if we don't get it done for the Modesto School, uh, at least for the Progressive Network overall, but I think that's a wonderful idea because I think certainly um, art and culture also plays a valuable role in how we interpret not just history, but also how we think about current events and what's going on in the world around us right now. And Robert, I'm glad you mentioned the breakout groups because this, the virtualness of you people with me not being able to touch you is something that is distracting. And with this many people, it's going to be difficult to hear your voices. And so we're going to be spending some more time training ourselves to have groups that we can divide up into smaller units to discuss things. And we'll have the classes are so full, we won't have, I don't think we'll have much in the way of breakout groups there. But on the, mon on the Mondays that we don't have classes, which are sprinkled throughout the thing, we do what we call a deeper dive. And that is explicitly for an opportunity for you to talk and for us to get to know each other better and to, and to use whatever the, the hot topic of that particular era was as a provocative piece to discuss to see how does that affect you now. And so we're looking forward to figuring out ways to use this virtual reality in a way that is uh, less virtual. More questions for Robert? And uh, by the way, while we wait for questions to come in in the chat, um, I do also want to say with the um, class sessions and, and such that are on the internet in terms of the readings and videos and such, I know that for each week there are a lot of various readings and videos uh, and really uh, different multimedia platforms that tie into each class. But what I will do is every class I'll, for the next class I'll say, really focus on certain specific videos or readings to make it a bit easier for everyone to stay on the same page. But certainly one of the things you do wanna think about is that each class you see listed on the Modesco website is meant to be a resource as well in terms of providing additional readings, providing videos, uh, film clips, et cetera. So really, again, take advantage of those uh, as we go forward. Okay, um, let's see. And I do agree with uh, Deborah about um, really trying to perhaps create some art as well. I think that's certainly an idea that we should explore. And I think in, in a lot of ways, our class is all about creating something new, especially when it comes to creating new projects for activism and the like, and also creating a new idea of participatory democracy and participatory citizenship. Okay, um, let's see. Is anyone linked with SC Progressive Network, particularly emulating Stacey Abrams organizing work around voting in Georgia? Well, Robert, that's one of the primary functions that the Progressive Network has been fulfilling for more than 25 years, the civic engagement. And one of the things that you'll find out in the Majeska School is that what the main problems that Georgia was having literally cannot happen here because of our Constitution. I'm not bragging about our Constitution. I'm just saying that you register for life here. They can't take your vote away like they did in Georgia. Uh, Ex-offenders get their rights back if we, you know, we're working on that. But we are, over the fact that we've been doing this for, for decades, in touch with the best practices and best sources for information across the nation, whether that's actual um, voting issues, uh, the machines we use, or right on up to re redistricting and uh, litigation. And uh, we have Vince Matthews is with us now, and, and Vince is our policy director, he's an attorney. He worked with us to develop the the uh, redistricting plan that's at fairmapssc.com. And so we have very deep roots into the inside system, but we also realize that we have to have the power outside the system to make the inside responsive. So yes, we're in touch. We know what's happening in Georgia 
and um, we're learning from it and we're applying it as it fits here. The tactics must fit where your feet hit the ground. Okay, um, and I do see a question about, um, are people able to play, uh, excuse me, pay per class if they can? Um, they're really in terms of finding out more about particular topics. So, so if someone wants to tackle that really quickly about paying per class versus um, other options. You said that in the chat, Brett? Yeah, that, that is uh, something actually we've done before when we had walk-ins, but there's no, no reason you can't go to the, and there's every reason you should, go to the donate button at the Majeska School, and you can set it up to make um, a, I think monthly is as quickly as you can make them, but you can make a monthly payment of um, $20 or $10 and do it that way and as pay as you go. And that will all be recorded automatically on your tuition. All right. Okay, so I do see a really interesting question um, Laura put in the chat about um, having a conversation between herself and Ian Anderson about the value of human rights as conceptualized by the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Thoughts on covering these as we go through? Uh, answer is yes. Um, we will talk about the UN Declaration of Human Rights when we get to talking about World War II and the post-World War II era, uh, partly because, as Brett alluded to at the beginning of our conversation this afternoon, um, James Burns played a pivotal role in U.S. foreign policy during and after World War II. But also of equal importance is that folks like W.E.B. Du Bois and others in the NAACP and various civil and human rights organizations in the U.S. were also part of that debate about what human rights meant to them and how they conceptualize human rights, not just in an American context, but as you'll see in this class, how many um, black activists and, and left-wing activists in the 30s and 40s tended to talk about human rights in a global perspective too. So that will certainly be part of our conversations when we get to the World War II and Cold War eras in this course. Okay, uh, let's see. Omari had another question. What is a current through line from the Southern strategy to today was Donald Trump a rebel and beneficiary of the Southern strategy? So uh, the short answer is we will certainly cover that during the semester in the class. But what I will say for today in particular is that it is difficult to separate the Republican party as it exists, not just Donald Trump, but the Republican party as a whole from ideas of not just the Southern strategy in terms of how it spoke to race, but also strategies developed during that same time in relation to striking down labor rights, uh, opposition to greater gender equality, opposition to uh, equality for LGBTQ individuals and so forth. Uh, but certainly it is difficult to think about Donald Trump or really the modern GOP without going back, not just to Richard Nixon and Barry Goldwater in the 60s, but also thinking about Strom Thurmond in the 60s and his switch from the Democratic and Republican parties and the longer, uh, changes in Southern politics in the World War II and Cold War era. So we'll certainly touch on that uh, this semester as well. Okay, okay, a question. See a few interesting comments in the chat. Okay, so the, ex so the expectation is to read all the material in syllabus for each class, no. Um, again, with the readings for each particular class, what I'll do is at the end of every class session, I will remind folks that while you do have uh, plenty of readings to choose from online, I will point out specific readings that I want everyone in the class to do. I know that most of the folks in the class, if not all of you, are either working full time or going to school full time. Some of you doing both. Uh, you have plenty of other things to do during the week. But what we're going to do is to make sure that everyone's doing at least a, a handful of readings and viewing a few videos during the week, uh, and that the rest of the material online should be thought of as supplemental material, material that you can view on your own time, but we highly encourage you to do so because as Brett and others have mentioned, there is plenty of rich material on the Majeska website. Uh, and between you and me, uh, I know this is a captive audience, I view some of these things from my classes at Claflin as well, just FYI. So there's a lot of excellent stuff online you should view, but I'll make sure to direct your attention towards the most important readings week to week. Okay, by any chance, will you be talking about the history of the party line entries on South Carolina ballot seems so problematic. You know, we will, we will definitely get into that as well. Um, 
again, a big part of the class, especially when we get to the, the antebellum period onwards, is talking about not just the politics of South Carolina's history, but also how it works on a local and state level in terms of voting rights, in terms of how ballots work and worked um, and so forth. So that will certainly be part of what we cover in the class this semester as well. Robert, let me speak to that a bit. That Robert's sure. specialty is history and my specialty is more political. And so the first seven classes are the people's history that inform our tactics and strategy. And so the seventh, eighth, and ninth or ninth, tenth class, the last three classes are um, theory, uh, analysis, and strategy. And we look at the various ways that, that democracy is practiced in South Carolina and the changes that could be made here. But we want to follow that up with something that we really haven't done a good job of over the last few years of doing the Majeska School, which is skills, skill sets. And so I, I consider these first, this first session that you're signed up for to be something that prepares you to be an effective citizen. There will be some of you out there that want to be more than an effective citizen. You want to help other people be effective citizens, and you want to make a vocation or just an avocation out of being an organizer. And so we're going to have an a la carte menu of skills and tools. Um, how do you use the state website to look up legislation by issue? Uh, and specifics about how different branches of the government are functioning and not functioning. We wanna do more work with local governments, but I think we may have one of the county councilors with us tonight. We've got some legislators that are participating. And so that there's uh, windows onto the different levels of government that affect your life. And we will strategize about where we can be most effective with leveraging policy work and civic engagement on different levels as uh, nonpartisan by strategy, not just by tax exemption. Um, we, we, we believed the founding fathers when they warned against starting political parties, when they said we're going to end up with two if we do. That was George Washington's farewell address, don't start political parties. And so we, we have um, uh, a very well-developed and thought-through approach to practicing the inside-outside game to leverage politics. And so that's something that we'll do in general, and then there'll be specific skill sets as to how to practice that where your feet touch the ground. Thank you, Robert. All right, so I do see um, a couple more questions in the chat. I'll start with Omari's question. Um, as usual, he's asking, uh, provocative and fascinating questions. Uh, why do you think Orangeburg is still scarred from the 1968 massacre and only recently embraced the city as a civil rights hotbed? And uh, why is it not recognized on par with a Selma, a Memphis, even a Ferguson? This is a really interesting question. And I don't want to sound like a broken record. Uh, certainly we will get more in depth with this later on in the semester. But I will say as someone who teaches A at Claflin University and B as someone who Actually, just this past week, I visited the um, all-star uh, bowling alley, you know, in Orangeburg, where the Orangeburg massacre was sparked in 1968. Um, I, I think part of your, the answer to your question, Omari, is that when we talk about the civil rights movement, we tend to privilege certain events, uh, the Brown v. Board decision, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, the Selma to Montgomery march in 65, uh, the Birmingham uh, campaign in 63, and so forth. And so South Carolina as a state tends to get ignored. And we'll actually spend a lot of time talking about that in some of the sessions for this class, because by the time you're done with the his history section of the Majestic School, what you'll come to realize that the civil rights movement, as many of you know it, uh, that 1954 and 1965 or 68 period, many, much of it has its origins in what's going on in South Carolina in the 20 years before that, in the 30s, 40s, and early 50s. However, the way the public tends to think about civil rights is through these big events involving Martin Luther King Jr., Jr., Rosa Parks, and so forth. Uh, and so certainly Orangeburg gets overshadowed by those events. Um, and also, I, I think I would also add to that, there is a sense that once you get 65 in the Selma March and the passage of the Voting Rights Act in August of that year, and by the way, I want to point out today is March 7th, which is the anniversary of Bloody Sunday in 1965 when marchers were beaten on the Emmett Pettus Bridge uh, protesting for voting rights. Um, I would say that when you're thinking about Orangeburg and those other events, they tend to be subsumed by the, the rise of black power and black nationalism across the United States. 
Uh, we tend to ignore things like the Jackson State Massacre in 1970 that gets overshadowed by what happened at Kent State. We ignore the Augusta riot. I'm actually from Augusta, Georgia. The Augusta riot in 1970 happened at the same time. So again, I think part of what the class is about is not only learning history, but also rethinking the history you've already learned and how the history you've learned in K through 12 or even in college, et cetera, or from popular history books or from the news, this history again needs to be interrogated. It needs to be questioned and it needs to be further fleshed out. Okay, um, next question. How will uh, this benefit someone from a small and unincorporated town where folks do not want change? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Uh, Brett, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I'm from a large country where folks don't want change. I don't know what his problem is or her problem. Um, we have tools that will help you do that. Let me, a, for instance, is looking at racial disparities in the criminal justice system 20 years ago, we tried to figure out how can we best take a bite out of systemic racism? Well, we used criminal justice as a really measurable way to, to evidence the disparate impact. Uh, they're you know, twice as likely to be arrested, twice as likely to serve more time in jail, et cetera, if you're a person of color. And that we then developed uh, legislation to require all cops to report all stops that ultimately passed in a watered down for fashion. But I don't know what town you're in, but you have at least two cops watching out after you. You've got local cops, municipal cops, county cops, state cops, all kind of cops. Those cops in your town are having to report because of the bill research we did and the bill we wrote everybody they stop and don't take into custody every month. So you can use that as a way to go talk to the people that are running your cop shop and thank them for reporting and ask them how you can get involved. So we've got tools that help you get into the door to talk to the people that are making decisions. And you can, and we also have attitudes that we've developed, say for instance, with your county director of your election boards, we probably know them. And over the 25 years we've been dealing with them, they've realized that we're their friends and not their enemies. We want to make their job easier and get them more money. And the majority party wants to make their job much harder. And so, yes, we have ways that you can do something that's productive no matter where you are, unless you live completely in the woods by yourself with no electricity and eat roots and berries, which sounds very attractive right now. All right, uh, any additional questions? We've got a few minutes left. Any other questions before I move on to talking about class one? Well, Robert, if there are no more questions, and this is not your last chance to ask questions, so, so we've got 14 more sessions here. And um, if, you, if you do have more questions, call, call me, email us, we'll be in touch. And that what we're gonna do, Chris, are you ready to queue up that last video? Yes, I can go ahead and um, share yep. that now if you're ready. Yeah, put that up there. We're going to play this and fade out after that, but uh, don't fade out too far. We'll be back Monday week, the the fifth. Is it the fifteenth? What what is this? Seventh? It's the yes, fifteenth. Yes, fifteenth mm -hmm. at six six thirty. The same channel here, and we'll send the link again, and uh, we will send out the class one uh, readings. Um, either tonight or tomorrow, so you can uh, be doing your homework. And we will do that every week for the next week's class. And uh, thank you again. And thank you, Dr. Green, for your just um, very successful and creative way of presenting reality to people. So you want to play that tune now, or that clip? Have people know how you feel, your political philosophy, and just the way she thinks, what makes her tick. I better not tell you everything I think, sir. <laughs> <laughs> the philosophy that we have had imposed upon us by the white majority through the generations in this country is that we just don't belong. We were taught from slavery that, and they're still telling us in action, if not in word, that we're not as good as they are. And I'm still concerned about the some conditions around the killing of Grant Brown by Officer Nates on November the 8th. Anytime you trample on the rights of one person in America, you eventually may trample on the rights of all.
we have high officials here in Columbia who say that uh, they commend the action of the state troopers in the murder. Now, this is something that makes students burn. It seems clear to us that the state police recklessly disregarded human lives and used excessive force to restrain the student demonstration. How can the governor and the citizens of South Carolina expect Negro youths to have respect for law and order when the very guardians of law and order show such brutality? Attorneys for the patrolmen said the patrolmen acted out of self-defense. So do white Americans face the responsibility. The jury was out for a little over 50 minutes of insisting that the law enforcement agencies of our society do in fact protect. They made their decision, all of its citizens, in favor of the patrolman, instead of doing injury and violence. We are supposed to respect certain laws that are tabulated, and if we eventually find that those laws are unjust by then, we have a right to go to court and fight the laws. We must demand more from our government officials now! I'm black, I'm proud, and I'm gonna fight for my people. I'm not begging you anymore. I've been begging you all these years. I'm not begging you anymore. I got the boot and I said, we'll see you at the ballot box. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everybody, and we'll see you uh, in seven, seven more days.